The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate and not that of Keller Williams TCI or any of its affiliates. Any action you take upon the information provided on this show is strictly at your own risk and Let's Talk TCI Real Estate guests or hosts will not be liable for any losses and damages in connection with the use of the material. I am not an investment advisor, broker, or dealer. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate. Another episode, another wonderful Thursday afternoon, another informative guest that we will be having a conversation with today. Um, as always, I encourage you to please like the page, share the page with anyone or any group that you know that will be interested in hearing about what we are speaking about today. Of course, we will be talking about the real estate market and the economy. Okay, if you do have any questions, please, um, during the course of the, in of the conversation, please include it in the live feed so that we can get to your questions um, before the end of the show. Also, I just want to remind everyone, of course, the show is for 45 minutes. I said, but such a topic as this, we may need more than 45 minutes, but get your questions in early so that we can get those questions answered. Okay? So, um, again, like, share the page, tell someone to tune in, and of course, you know, I just like to get right into um, right into um, my segment of the day. Oh, and one last thing before I forget, I also just want to um, say thanks again to those from the planning department who was on the show on last week and who spoke about the sustainable development plan. Please, if you did not have an opportunity to watch that show, please go back on the Facebook page and revisit it. There is a lot of um, valuable information that you can learn about and also they are currently still in their process of consultation so this is your opportunity to be able to submit any comments that you may have in reference to the sustainable development plan plan okay and um without any further delay um normally i would have my guests to introduce themselves but I'm just going to do a pre-introduction just in short form, and then I will allow him to add any finishing touches to the introduction because definitely this is a man of experience, of knowledge, and great credentials. And for sure, I know I cannot list the many things that he's capable of within this um, time frame of it to, to say for a proper introduction. But I just want to point out one or two things um, from his bio, as a summary, this gentleman is actually a professor. He's Professor um, Gilbert Morris. He's a poet, a philosopher, an economist, legal scholar, and he's also a diplomat. He was born in the Bahamas, and he's also a native citizen of the Turks and Caicos Islands by virtue of his parents by birth. He was a senior economic advisor to the Ministry of Finance in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, he was also the chairman of the National Investment Agency of the Turks and Caicos Islands. He has written hundreds of academic papers on artificial intelligence, digitized smart communities, global finance, sovereign wealth funds, and also island economies. These are just some of the things I have pinpoint out of his biography because I want you to be able to see what I'm, I mean, to get a general understanding of who we have on the show today. So you must be locked in because this is going to be a wealth of knowledge that is being put forward today. And with that, I ask um, Professor Morris, if you want to add anything to that I mean, introduction, please do so at this time. No, it's just it's just very nice to be with you, cuz, and uh, I I just uh, I love your show. I, I I went back and looked at a couple of uh, uh, episodes just to get myself uh, familiar. So you 
obviously run a very intelligent shop, and I'm, I'm actually proud of you, and I think you're doing a good work for the Turks and Caicos. Thank you. Um, everyone, you know, has to play their part, and I feel like this is just my contribution to get that information out there, you know, to persons who may be a, um, a bit shy to step forward and get it for themselves, and we are all our brother's keeper. So, yeah, thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So, um, when, I, when I was given the introduction, um, one of the things... Um, we're going to get into everything, but one of the things I did notice in your bio, you were talking about digitized smart community. Um, you know, before we get into the meat of everything else, I would like for you to elaborate on that aspect of a smart community and what this is about and um, show how, um, if this is something that countries should be looking towards moving forward to in the future. Yes, that's a very good uh very good way to introduce uh, because I believe that islands in the Caribbean and certainly Turks and Caicos amongst them uh, has the best chance in the world to become what you call a smart community. If you look at some place like, like Estonia, Estonia was under the Russian, the Soviet thumb for 72 years up until 1992 when after Gorbachev did Glasnost, Perestroika and so on, the Soviet Union collapsed and they told Estonia, you're on your own now. Thank you for the 72 years. Bye-bye. And uh, Estonia had one telephone in the entire country. One telephone. Right. For about a million, a million people. And uh, um, uh, Finland was changing their telephone system from an analog system to a digital system and offered Estonia the, fin the Finnish telephone system, right, to help them out. Estonia said no. Mm -hmm. And they went from, they decided they would do their own thing, and they went ahead and they built Skype. And they made Skype their phone system. So this is an example of a smart technology, a country using a smart technology to lift itself out of 72 years of economic stagnation and oppression and leap forward into the future. They didn't stop there. Estonia said, we're going to change the way people think about technology and countries. So not only are we going to do that, we're going to declare that broadband, the access to Wi-Fi, is now in Estonia a human right a human right. Everyone has a right to this. And once they did that and altered their constitution to that effect, they then wired up every school. Then they said, we're going to do another thing. You have the virtual person, you have the biological person. Nowhere in the world are these two people together. Your virtual self is over here all over the place. Your biological self is in one place. Your virtual self is exponential. Your biological self is arithmetical. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to join these two together, and Estonia will be the first place in the world where when we refer to you as a human being, we mean both your virtual self and your biological self. And we will, in our constitution, we will identify that your virtual self belongs to you absolutely. So they did that. Then they did something else. They said, you know, now that we have this country where we are Skype, where uh, our broadband, Wi-Fi is a human right, just like right to life, right? And now you have your virtual and your biological self unified. We're going to do something else. We're going to change government from the idea of the, the institution that rules the country to government as a service to its citizens. So while we say that philosophically, all governments say we are happy to serve the people, but governments say that, but they don't actually do that. So what we are going to do is change our government around and reform it using technology so that the government becomes a service to the citizen. And when I was in Estonia last time, we were having a big conference and the Minister of Health was trying to demonstrate how this service works. 
So someone had just had a baby. So she says, in other countries, when someone has a baby, you have the baby, then you have to get a bunch of documents, and the doctor has to sign them. Then you have to go stand in line at this office. Then you have to stand in another office. Then you have to go pay, right? In Estonia, we send you a, a hello, a, a congratulations. We ask you the name of the baby, right? In a, in a, in a, you just fill it in a, in a box in the, in, the, in the email. And when you send that name, that name transfers to you, and that tells you right away that uh, there are no, you don't have anything else to do. All you have to do is tell us where to spend your money, which is the money that you get to support you for your child welfare. Everyone is entitled to that. So all we need to know is the name of the child and the place where we send the money. And you don't have to stand in line for anything. In two weeks, the child will have a passport. Right. So that's a smart country. Because it eliminates, you know, people talk, you all across the Caribbean, if, if you have to do anything with governments, it's all day. License your car, renew your business license, do anything or online. It's always wasting time. Smart countries eliminate that. I'll tie into COVID-19. Estonia and Dubai have two countries in I so in Dubai, you get an app, an app, you can apply, you need groceries, you need something's wrong in your home, you, you're feeling symptoms or anything like that. You don't have to leave your home line or panic for anything. So the countries, uh, I, I discuss with them, that's all right, I discuss with them, you know, how to to carry out policy. They want to hear the policy. They want to hear where the policy has been implemented before somewhere. And then they stop there. Mm -hmm. And my point is you, you're not finished. You have to figure out how to achieve the ends of the policy without inconveniencing your citizens. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a Caribbean airport now, you have the lines for the people where they are testing on the ground, or you have lines lined up where people are getting sanitized and all that kind of thing. And so you add that to the lines we used to have before. Right. If you go to Dubai and Estonia or Singapore, when they design their policy, they design their policy to eliminate the lines they had before. Right. So they design their policy to achieve the objective of staying use safety as the excuse for you having to stand in the line. They say, no, safety is the service, and what we're going to do is we're going to use smart technology part of us to eliminate you having to wait online because it's already a coronavirus. You're already very stressed. The last thing we want to do is have you stand in an even longer line with children, tired people, and so on. And then we make excuses to you, but we're just trying to keep you safe. So smart countries operate on a different mind frame than countries. Right. Sorry, I just want to pause for a moment. Um, I, I mean, just, so, I don't know if it's my internet or your internet, because sometimes it's coming in and out. So do forgive me if, just right. say I ask you something more than once. Yes. But I, I, I was following, That's you, That's right. following you definitely when you were That's talking right. about we, the line. We will fight our way we will fight we will fight we it through. We will fight our way through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that it's a good explanation. And I, I mean I did follow you and I did I did like the analysis you gave about the virtual self and the biological self. And because you right. were talking about an example of Skype. Um, um, because of COVID-19, I think it has forced a lot more countries now to start thinking about a smart way forward. And I think right. that, um, you know, I'm trying, I don't really, it is a real estate show and it is whatever, but I, I still want to choose my words carefully in saying that. Right. I, I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, even in the Turks and Caicos Islands, it will, you know, you know, it, 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 we, things will change. 
and it will go the smart route yeah. instead of business as normal. Right. You know? So, and I think that well, one also, thing- also, sorry, I said, I think it also um, benefits even like we're talking about real estate and investment. Investors do want to know about smart communities to know that things move more efficiently, you know, for business purposes. And I think that is a plus to draw investors into your island as well, islands as well. Yes, I, I think you're right about that. And, and, and what I would say is, number one, Turks and Caicos is in a better position to be a smart country than Estonia is. And the economic model that Turks and Caicos has, which is really a one-legged model to, 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 to some degree, I mean, tourism is really the, the low star. And then after tourism, because our real estate industry is partly inside our tourism industry because of the condos, right? So our real estate industry is part of our tourism industry. You have a one-dimensional economy. And so if you take a place like Estonia, the, the business model that we have would benefit more from being a smart country than Estonia's in their in their area. Because if, so for instance, right now, Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in, on January 20th this year, I was invited by a, a, a business group to, to do an action plan for COVID-19 because one of the things I've tried to explain is that a pandemic is not about medicine. Okay. It's about, it's about logistics. It's about biostatistics. It's about exponentiality. It's about demographics, right? It's about facilities capacity. These are things that economists think about every day. So medicine is just one feature of it. But what you're trying to do is create a map of the society and all social interactions and see how you can catch a, a, a disease and slow the infection rate. I can get very technical and mathematical about it, but I won't do that. But what I'm trying to show you is, if Turks and Caicos is going to be successful, not just in, because there's no defeating COVID-19. You're not going to defeat it. Right. If we're going to be successful, and I'll say two things about that. In that action plan, which was submitted to the IDB and 18 governments around the world, and I did share it with the governor and, and, and the premier as well. Okay. In that action plan. I make this point. Number one, COVID is not going anywhere. That's January 20th now. Mm -hmm. COVID is not going anywhere. Number one, there was a plague in 1347 called the bubonic plague. It killed 50% of Europe Mm -hmm. and then it killed uh, uh, people for the next 300 years with constant outbreaks. Mm -hmm. And there were 10,000 cases in the 20th century, and China just closed down a city because of the bubonic plague, not COVID, the bu- from 670 years ago. Right. So, so still there. Yes. So COVID is not going anywhere, and COVID is more pernicious than the bubonic plague. Mm-hmm. That's, that's number one. Number two, I argue that because the United States did not take a federal approach meaning President Trump said, okay, let's close the entire country down for one month in January or February Mm -hmm. and move our old people to safe places, move people with pre-existing conditions, what we call comorbidities, to safe places, so people with diabetes, lupus, sickle cell, and all that, move them to to, 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 to safe places. Close the place down and let's sweat out the virus. He didn't do that. So each state did at different times. So you, you always have 27 states where the virus is exploding. Right. Right. What does that mean for Turks and Caicos, for the Bahamas, for the Caribbean? That means no tourists. That means very few tourists. That means a loss of 85% of national income. Because, and look at what's happening now. American Airlines just announced that they're laying off large numbers of people. United has announced that they're laying off large numbers of people. Hotels are laying off in Turks and Caicos and in other places, laying off large amounts of people. All right? It's become difficult. Airlines, 
can't travel because under the CARE Act, they try to get liability because people don't want to wear masks. You've had 30 cases now in the last months where airlines in the United States had to land before they got to their destination because someone tried to fight a stewardess because they didn't want to wear masks. So, so you can't... Go ahead. You can't, fill, you can't fill planes to come to Turks and Caicos under those circumstances. So then I... Go ahead. Go on. No, we'll go on. finish your thought, then I have a question. Okay. And so if, if there's an outbreak, additionally, if there's an outbreak in Turks and Caicos, just as the Bahamas was banned by the United States, Turks and Caicos will be banned. So the secret really is, like Estonia, like Dubai, we have to use smart technologies because you're not going to defeat COVID. We have to be able to detect COVID and to be able to, uh, to monitor for COVID mm -hmm. and to be able to initiate fast track um, uh, medical care where we see outlines of COVID emerging. And if we're able to do that and monitor effectively, then we'll, but the only way to do that is to be a smart country. That's the only way. So then based on all those things you were saying, right? So then if you were um, someone who wanted to invest in the Turks and Caicos, with all of those things you are saying over there, would you at this right. time decide to invest or not? And why? <laughs> That's a good, Turks and Caicos is always a good investment because I, I had a, uh, my, my brother-in-law played uh, in the NFL and in the National Football League for, for the Denver Broncos and the Chicago Bears. And when he got his last contract, mm -hmm. he got a $13, $13 million, four or five-year contract. You know what his first words were? Now I can go to Turks and Caicos. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mystique about Turks and Caicos. It's now mentioned the same way of Monaco, St. Bart's, Saint Tropez. But we don't have any of the systems, and we haven't concentrated on building out any of the systems that those countries have. So that's one. Number two, people would want to come to Turks and Caicos because it's wide open. So if you live in Middle Caicos or you live in North Caicos or even in Grand Turk in some parts of Provo, you're actually in a wide open area. You have your own property. So people feel safer there, let's say, than in New York City where everyone's on top of each other. Mm -hmm. right? Or in London or any big city around the world. So in that sense, it's safe. But if, but, but if you're a billionaire sitting in Connecticut right now, where you have all the hedge fund managers, so lots of billionaires and concentrated in one area, word gets around. If one buys a gold, you know, golf club, everyone buys that same golf club. One buys a jet, everyone buys that same jet because they're all the same rich and they all want to be in the same so one guy says, but where can we go? Where can we go to get, because look at what's going to happen. Between now and November with the elections, the United States is going to be chaos. That's going to produce more BLM protests. That's going to be chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Plus you have coronavirus in, the win coronavirus in the winter is coming. That's going to be chaos. Where can we go? They are looking for some country to put up a flag and say, hey, we have all the technology. We're very smart. We have wide open spaces. We have the medical services. And look at our coronavirus. Look at our management of the pandemic. We've done so well. Let us do the same thing for you. Come to our country where you can be safe, where we have the right medical services, where we make decisions very quickly, where we were very successful, and our approach to, 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 to uh, taking care of people with COVID-19 is rational and praised by the rest of the world. If a country in the Caribbean can say that and it be true, that country would be overrun by the people trying to get there. So can, can the Turks and Caicos Islands say that? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, you know, there's a story in the Miami Herald today called... Turks and Caicos struggles with coronavirus. Mm. A, big, a big story in the Miami Herald today. So if the guy in Connecticut reads that story, he's going to be like, okay, Turks and Caicos is having the same problems as the United States. They're not, they're not on top of it. There are countries that are on top of it. Taiwan, children are going to school. Everything's open. They have no new cases for the last three months. 
And that's a country of 24 million people. Mm -hmm. South Korea, doing very well. Singapore, doing very well. Iceland, doing very well. Estonia, doing very well. Dubai has turned, Dubai, to get into Dubai, you get tested. Dubai has sniffer dogs that can identify uh, uh, the virus, right? They're using UV lights, all these things for you to get in. They have, as I said, an app, uh, and I've called for this in, my, in the action plan, what is called an e-diagnostic survey. So let's suppose you're sitting, you're sitting there now and you feel some of the symptoms. So you go on your phone and you say, I feel scratching in my throat, my body feels weak, I've lost my sense of smell, and you, you, you click on each of these things, and when you hit send, that goes to a central database. Immediately, someone calls you and tells you to self-isolate. Mm -hmm. Then it runs a Bluetooth contact tracing on your phone, and it okay. can see everyone you've been in contact with for the last two weeks on a big screen. Then it can call those people and tell them to self-isolate. Then you use your tests, and you go and you test those people. The reason you test them, so some people say, no, you don't have to test them. You just isolate yourself, and you'll be fine. But the reason you test them is you have to find the super spreader. Right. You have to find the asymptomatics. Right. Right? And so you're using your tests surgically. So there's no point now in trying to test the entire population, because that only matters if you acted on January 20th. Okay. Before COVID-19 was in your country. Right. Once it's in your country, what you have to do now is detect and monitor. Okay. Detect and, mo and, you, have to, and you have to teach the population how to identify the symptoms. You're not going to, if, if all you're doing is waiting for people to come to the hospital when they feel bad, mm -hmm. you're never, everyone's going to get infected. Okay, so so then, so then if the government just say if the government isn't doing what they are supposed to do, right? What what recommendations, um, in reference to real estate? What recommendations yeah. can you give, or what advice would you give to I um, mean the Turks and Caicos Hotel and Tourism Association, or as well as the Turks and Caicos Real Estate Association, because like you said earlier in, in your statement, it's like they go hand in hand with the tourism and the real estate sector. Right. What can we as bodies do to attract, uh, to attract persons to the country to, I mean, to make it more desirable, despite all that's happening with the coronavirus at this time? Everybody, everybody has to behave. The, the business community should get together should get together. There's no point in complaining to the government. Right. The reality is the reality. If we don't think the government's doing well, now is not the time to beat up on the government, mm -hmm. right? The business community has to get together and they have to have a goal. They have to put a task force together and that task force has to have a goal to be able to identify Turks and Caicos Islands as a COVID-free zone. And a COVID-free zone does not mean there's no COVID there. So it's a COVID trust zone. It means that the, the local people and the investors trust the system that we put in place to manage the pandemic. That's what it means. We trust the system. Now, if you have Turks and Caicos Islanders walking around who are saying, man, the information coming out is confusing. One minute we're doing this, one minute we're doing that, but then the case is outbreak, then there's an explanation. Then So you have this problem in the Bahamas. In fact, all the headlines on the Bahamas about the management of the COVID, uh, the, 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 the pandemic, has been confusion. That's what they've said, not me. That's what the newspapers have said, not, and not here, all over the world. Right. Confusion in the Bahamas. And the reason they say that is because they're looking at the Bahamas and saying, my God, you have all those islands. How can you let in those tiny islands with 300 people or 1,500 people that had zero cases, how could you let cases rise up in those islands? You should have shut those off and made, test everybody because it's a small amount of tests, test everybody three times. And let me make sure you understand. The population of Turks and Caicos is just short of 50,000, right? Okay. 
if we're going to build an economic model that gets people to come in and buy real estate and you know build houses and get do the investor PRC and uh, and buy condos, mm-hmm. we need three million tests. Okay. Because you have to you have to test all school children, right? But you have to test them again and again. Why? That's different from the general public. All teachers have to be tested, tested again and again, almost every day. Right. Right. Because you have to protect the children. I have recommended that you recreate school systems in large buildings where teachers, like hotels, where teachers can be on site and don't leave, and you run the education system for six weeks at a time, and then break, and then six weeks, and then break. So the teachers have to live on the campus, the hotel campus, with the children. Mm -hmm. Because that's, again, that sounds radical, but again, that's better than a large outbreak, and then you get banned. Right. That's better than that. Number two, you have to designate how many rooms are available in the country? How many rooms are available? Okay. If you have, let's say we have 3,000 rooms. Okay. That means we can only use 2,000 of them because you're going to need 1,000 of them for quarantine. Mm -hmm. And staff is going to have to live on those properties and not leave for six weeks. Otherwise, you have to keep retesting them every day. Right. Because you let them go home into the general population. So if we say we're going to run a new program, and this is why you have to have a partnership between the government and the hotels, because they have to come together and say, how many rooms do we have available? We have so many rooms available. Okay, do we have a booking system? So I know we have a brilliant guy there, Val, who has a booking system. We go to Val, we say, Val, we need you to set up a booking system. We're going to take these 2,000 rooms, we're going to price them a certain way. So maybe $1,000 a night, mm-hmm. right? Or we'll do an all-inclusive for $1,500 a night or a lump sum for the month. And you're required, if you come to Turks and Caicos, you're required to stay one month. Why do you do that? Because it means less moving parts. Because if people are coming every day, then you have to work that every day. So you have to come up with a strategy. And maybe what I'm saying stumbles on some technical issue, but then you just switch it because... A, a, a pandemic is a, is a zone in which you do not say, I know what to do. You say, I'm willing to learn, unlearn, and relearn what is necessary to do in real time. That's yeah. how you get through a pandemic. You know, if you sit there thinking you know exactly what to do, you will end up killing people. I agree with that. You have to have this flexible spirit. So... If the government, if, if, the, if the private sector says, okay, the government systems, forget about whether it's the PNP or the PDM, the, the government systems itself is too slow. We can't allow our businesses to die and can't allow the brand to suffer. So we're going to come together. We're going to set up a booking system. We're going to set up, set a price. We're going to isolate a set of rooms. We're going to share the revenue amongst us, like the NFL, like, like, like the NFL and the NBA owners, they take in money and they share it between all the teams, right? So you take that model just for the crisis and you right. say, we're going to do that so we can all survive, right? So you build that out. And now what you do is you go to an uh, airline or you go to Inter-Caribbean that has a couple of jets and you say, we want to do a charter service Because we think commercial airlines, that's too complex. We don't control commercial airlines. And if people don't want to wear masks, we can't control that. That's up to the airline, and that's in the United States and so on. So we're going to pick five cities. We're going to run charters to those cities. It'll be our airlines, and we'll set the terms and conditions whether you can come on or not. Now, people may say, man, that's too ambitious. Actually, that's what Freeport used to do, the Princess Towers and Country Club in Freeport did not depend on commercial airlines to fill their hotels. They use a charter service and they fill their hotels and they were very successful. So let me ask you something. Is this just your personal opinion or is this an economist speaking at this point in time? Because this is a lot of information. 
Shinja yeah. is coming yeah. out and, and you've, you've actually raised a lot of good points, you know, that I right. haven't thought about and personally haven't thought about. And that's why I wanted to based on an, an economic study or just, you know. Yes, it's based, it's, on the, it's, it, yeah, it's based on a stage analysis of each. So, so when you're in a situation like this, right, you, you, there's, there's certain things you're trying to, I could, that's why I said I could get technical about it and mathematical, but I won't do that, right? So if, but I'll say some things. If you accept that everything you're doing to beat and to outpace the coronavirus is arithmetical, meaning you're doing one thing, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing, right? But the disease and its infection rate is exponential, mm -hmm. meaning one person can infect 50 people. So by the time you've tested 10 people, another 200 people have been infected. Right. So testing people can't get you to the place where you get to equilibrium. Now, there's some other things you have to do. You have to put in place social distancing and other measures. Then you have to find something which in math is called an r naught number. And that r naught number, you have to balance that with your, your and, and establish what is called a, a, a um, proportionality constant. Okay, those are mathy things that nobody cares about. And so I'm, I, what I'm, but what I'm pointing out to you is, what I'm telling you is based on that math. That's right. what I'm saying. It's, it's an economic assessment. So everything you're doing is to create this proportionality constant. Proportionality constant means the measures that you're taking, it's limiting the infection spread. Right. And creating a space where you can do business. Right. So basically, right? So, then, if we don't manage this, you, I mean, what, what are you saying? What are you saying is going to happen to the real estate market? Well, th there's a risk. I mean, Turks and Caicos is okay for the moment, but if you have a continued, I mean, COVID, let's look at the what we call the the the, the linear problem. If if Mr. Trump between now and November 20th, nothing is going to get better because Mr. Trump has never, ever made a situation. I've either known him or known about him for 35 years. He's never made a situation better in his entire life. He's not going to start now. Let me stop you right there. So nothing is going to get better. You mean worldwide? Nothing is going to get better? No, no, no. Within the, United, within, the United States, within the United States, because that's where our tourists come from. Okay, that's so, right. Clarif clarif so the situation is not, yeah, the situation is not going to get better, right? So that's one. Number two, you have all these protests on the street. That's another complication. Mm -hmm. the, you didn't get the stimulus package to people when the last stimulus ended. So they have to fight about that. So people are losing jobs, high unemployment. There's a great deal of social anxiety and the deaths are spiraling. Right. At the same time, you have BLM on the streets protesting about uh, the, 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 the murders. Plus, then you have the coronavirus. So if Mr. Trump, so you have the elections November 20th. If he wins, it's more of the same. If he loses, it's chaos between November 20th and January 20th. So again, no solution to the place where we get our tourists from. If Biden wins, Biden is going to shut the entire country down for at least a month. That's going to take him three weeks to do. Mm. It, and after that month, it's going to take about eight to ten weeks to reopen the country. That's June of next year. So if you can't get, you, you can't get any semblance of true tourism between now and June of next year, how are we going to feed Turks and Caicos Islanders? Where are the jobs going to come from? What's the plan to take care of people? How are people going to pay their rent and have water? What about people who have dialysis? What if someone has a heart attack? What if there's a big car accident that injures 15 people, but the beds are filled with people with coronavirus? Right. So, so you have to, that's why you need a task force because you have to do what we call gaming out all of these options. You have to game them out. You have to map them out. 
Right. And then you have to make decisions based on some mean between the worst and the best case scenario, some balance between the worst and the best case scenario. So you already know now from this analysis that June of next year, <clears throat> if you're right. looking for some semblance of normalcy, you're at June of next year. So then your, then your question is, what do we do now? Yes. So if you say, well, what are we, what's our objective now? You don't make money in Turks and Caicos unless you get American heads in Turks and Caicos beds. That's how you make money in Turks and Caicos. You need American heads in Turks and Caicos beds. The second thing you, know, you need is you need a portion of those Americans to buy Turks and Caicos real estate. Mm -hmm. This is what you need, right. right? Okay. So the question is... So how do we accomplish given, this? Mm -hmm. Right. Given what we've laid out, given what we've laid out about June of next year, right? are you going to get enough heads in beds to be able to feed yourself? And if you bring those heads to put them in beds and you don't have a system in place, do you run the risk? We had a, a, a travel advisory in June, a travel advisory in July. I don't know if we have one for August and so on. Those travel advisories, need, they lead to travel bans. So if you say, hey, we're going to open the country up and have people come in and you don't have the systems in place, you are going to suffer. There was a hotel that called me, big hotel, and they said, hey, you know, we were on a Zoom call with you and, you know, we, uh, we followed your advice on the COVID-free zone and we had our property broken into, you know, two-thirds plus one-third for, 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 for quarantine and we actually have charters bringing our people in and so on and it's working, but you know, we, we, we've had a couple of mishaps with uh, COVID-19 infections. I go, my point is, is when you don't have an electronic monitoring system, right. you don't have contact tracing, you don't have e-diagnostic surveys, you haven't established what the rate is for a proportionality constant. You're right. not trying to establish an r naught number between how rigid is your social distancing practices compared to, you know, the, uh, the, certain, the number of people that you have. There's something called a Dunbar number. Dunbar number says that, this is another economic term, but it says that you can really only manage 150 people at a time. Mm -hmm. each, each. So that means you have to break the groups up or the sets of rooms into 150 because that's the most people you can manage and have contact with everyone in one day at one time. Okay. So that means that if, if someone, so if, 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 if your group came to me and said, okay, doc, you head up the task force and tell us what to do. Most people look at what you're doing and they think they can do what you're doing because they think all it is is, okay, is you, 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 you use two thirds of your room, you have some rooms for, 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 for quarantine and then people wear masks and they do sanitation. No, that's not all that's going on. In addition to all of that, you're actually analyzing how the social distancing practices, right, right. Are, is, are affecting the infection rate so you could get an R0 number and then you can establish and sort of tweak over here to have an impact over there so you can establish a proportionality constant. Right. It's the math that you have to get right. Right. And the map tells you how to get every. So people see you doing these things. And so I said to them, you follow what I said, but you didn't understand that there was this technical aspect to it. That's why people who do this are called epidemiologists or econometrics or actuaries. They have names, they have titles because they study this kind of stuff all the time. Right? right. So I studied all 239. Uh, pandemics in the history that we know of in history and the major four pandemics and the 25 ones that killed more than 3 million people and looked at what countries did in those circumstances going back all the way to the 4th century AD. 
So my point is that it's not a simple thing. You have to, so, so if, if your group was saying, I, I would explain that, we know that June of next year, so that means like next fall is the first time you're going to approach any sort of normalcy, right? Okay. But, but you have to put this technological platform in place to monitor and to detect COVID. You mu that must happen. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Okay, so I have two questions. One about the technological platform, and then also I just want to stick a pin in here. Um, earlier, when COVID came up, the government had um, created a, a STEM duty initiative. We did see an influx at that time of some real estate investment that was happening. Do you think right. something like this should be initiated again um, to help um, stimulate the, the real estate market? And then, yes. go ahead. You answer that uh, first, and then yeah. I'm going to ask you about the technological side. Go ahead. Okay, yes. But here's the thing again. You have to measure, you have to measure it. When I was chairman of, Invest, of TC Invest, one of the things I said is concessions are not gifts. You don't give concessions. Right. You exchange concessions. Okay. Right? Good way to put it. All of the Caribbean, we, we give concessions, then we get mad at the government, the, the opposition party gets mad at the government, so they gave away too much, and then the opposite the party, the government says, no, we didn't give away that much, and they are talking about something that is complete nonsense. It's not a question of whether you gave away too much. That's not the issue. The issue is, did you have an exchange? Right. So when you take the stamp duty exemption, you have to measure that against what income you are going to generate over the period of time. You have a target. Correct. So you have to say the, the stamp duty exemption is an investment on which I expect to yield such and such a thing. So the answer shouldn't be we did a stamp duty exemption and it did have an effect. No, it should be we did a stamp duty exemption which was X number, meaning it, it cost us X number in law stamp duty. Right. But it produced X number in sales. Correct. All because right. those sales means that your family gets fed, your bills get paid, so the money circles throughout the economy. Correct. So then the government has to have what you call a multiplier analysis to say, we got this money in came primarily through real estate and lawyers and so on, but the multiplier effect offset the government's cost of dealing with coronavirus because it allowed citizens who are working in those areas to be able to fend for themselves and the government did not have to provide them stimulus. Right. No, I got you. I understand. Yes. So it's an exchange. Right. I agree with that. Right. And the right. question I want to ask based on um, you were talking about the technological side, and I agree with what you were saying, you need about the smart community, the technological side and managing this COVID um, pandemic. The premier said today in her press release about the economy, um, she was talking about the state of the economy in terms of say we're not in a recession as yet. However, we will be in, an, in, a, in a recession. Um, I'm just quoting, please. Um, tell me if I quoted her incorrectly. So if we will be in a recession then, then how do you, I mean, where do we get this money from? Because we're, we're, we're hoping that, the, I mean, there is no revenue actually coming into the country to be able to cover the cost of being able to improve on our technological aspects of doing all of this for COVID-19 to make it better. Well, the truth of the matter is, a recession is two or more quarters of negative growth or loss of employment and right. a number of other number of other variables. So in my view, the question of the recession is out the window. We are we are facing depression. Right? Okay. We are facing or, and not just Turks and Caicos, all over the world. Worldwide, We're facing, yes. Yeah, depression. You can't lose eighty five percent of your national income and then say so her advisors have to be a little, she's an economist, so she's not supposed, she, her advisors are telling her, this is our analysis of the situation. So those advisors have to be a little bit more sanguine to make sure the political directorate really understands what we are facing. Right. And the, the matter is, Turks and Caicos has a lot of uh, financial levers. We've got a liquid um, 
uh, national insurance. Uh, the government has had uh, a substantial cash reserve. I think we got about $8 million in the sovereign fund. Okay. All right. Now, here's the problem. Again, if you know that it's going to be June of next year, maybe next September or November before you see an appreciable growth in any income into the country, mm -hmm. I can give you a scenario where all that cash gets used up. Quickly. And we go, and we go over a cliff. Quickly. Because what's going to happen is you have to decide whether you starve the population and hold on to the cash or assist the population. Now, how do you do that? So this is where your point about real estate and condos come in. Right. And this is our point about heads and beds. Right. So, so we, know, we know that June to November of next year is the critical per period. Mm -hmm. in which we can expect very little income based on the normal functioning of the economy. Right. Therefore, we have to do something innovative and extraordinary to get heads in beds, and we have to buy something, pay for some, some sort of system, and somebody to manage it who understands it, to make sure that when we get those heads in beds, that they don't produce outbreaks. Right. And then when we achieve that, we can run these incentive programs where we exchange in incentives. And then we tally that against what we want the yield to be, what we want the returns to be to us. And so, so for instance, one of the, if the premier called me right now and said, Morris, solve this problem. I would do all the things I already said to you. Right. But then, but then when I come to your office and say, I, I put the, the, I've gotten the old people out of the way. I've gotten the people with pre-existing conditions out of the way. I've gotten, you know, uh, um, the technological platform to monitor COVID. I've put in my radical social distancing protocols and so on. And so I've established an R0 number. And now I have my, my technological team looking at that with my actuaries and my econometrists, you know, looking at that so they can be able to judge where things are going, so I can see when the numbers go this way or that way. I have to tighten a little bit. I have to loosen up a little bit and so on. You have to have this mechanism. Otherwise, you don't know what you're doing, right? So I have all that in place. Now I come to your office, and you say, Professor Morris, tell me, I see what you're doing. I feel safe. I trust the system that's in place because right. I see – you know how to manipulate it to make the numbers go up, down. I see the rate is going down. I see you know how to manipulate the social distancing to cause this effect and establish a proportionality constant. I see that. But Professor Morris, where are we going to get money from? I mean, we need income. I say to you, all right. Now that we've established this, we have to let the world know that we've established this and that they're safe, right? And then we have to set up a process for getting heads in beds and getting real estate sales going. So for heads and beds, we set up a system, as I say, maybe 30 days. You have to stay 30 days. You have to pay a certain amount. Maybe it's all-inclusive. So all 2,000 rooms that are participating in this program have to become all-inclusive for that period. Why all-inclusive? Because that means less moving parts. You don't have restaurants. So everybody, everybody shares the money. All restaurants, all hotels, everybody, we share the money. So you get the money for your running costs for those hotels who are doing it, but then the rest of the money, the profits that are generated are shared with other hotels so they can maintain themselves, especially the ones that are keeping older people and keeping people with pre-existing conditions. And that means they are Turks and Caicos Islanders working in those hotels. You have to pay them as well and maintain them in a safe, uh, trusted environment as well. So then I'll say to you, uh, now that we have heads and beds, Right. Let's run, let's run a simulation of our, let's do for real estate, let's do two things. Let's do the tax duty exemption and let's do the PRC investment. Okay. So, so we're going to do the tax exemption that people look at that and go, wow, that, okay, this is the time to buy. Why would they buy now? Why would you do a tax exemption now? Why would you do the 
wealthy now because in the places where wealthy people are, they're looking at Trump, BLM, and pandemic, and the winter is coming. Okay. So they have a, what we, uh, economists are always asking you, where's the demand going to come from? Where are the people going to come from who say, I want this product you're selling? Where's it going to come from? We have this unique opportunity, and this is the opportunity in the crisis. We have this unique opportunity mm -hmm. that we don't have to ask that question. We know where the people are. They're in Connecticut. They're in Boston. They're in New York. They're in Philadelphia. They're in Chicago. They're in Houston. They are in LA. Okay, yeah. That's, they don't want to be in those places. And in addition to that, remember, long before COVID, I've been talking about this for 10 years, there are 100 million people retiring in the United States over the next 35 years. So those people now, if you're a billionaire, you're 62, your wife is 58, your mother is 89, right? Your brother is 50, and you're worth $200 million, and you're thinking, where can I go? Oh, that Turks and Caicos. They established something called an r naught number. Can someone please tell me what the devil that means? Oh, it means that they know the impact of their social distancing on the infection rate. They know that. They're not guessing it. They know it mathematically. And they are able to increase their social distancing and have an impact on the infection rate. And they've got it systematized across an electronic platform. Wow. But underneath that, it's still Turks and Caicos. My goodness, it's still the prettiest place on earth. It's still got great beaches and good real estate. So now that they have this system in place where I can be safe and they move their, their, their people out of the harm's way so that the, the hospitals are there so they have good medical services and they bought what medical services they need to support them. They bought, so they did a partnership, which one of the things I would do, do a right. partnership with Georgetown University or do it with you know, Emory University in Atlanta or call you know, these kinds of things so that you have backup on these things. And then that person then says, let's go to the Turks and Caicos because I saw that they're actually doing a, Mr. Lancey has proposed something about a, an exemption on stamp duty, and it's only going to last for a certain period. So they say, let's get into that. Then the brother comes and say, hey, hey, guess what? We can invest a little bit more and get PRCs, permanent residency, in Turks and Caicos. What does that do for you? It boosts real estate sales, it gets heads and beds, and it promotes construction. Besides tourism, what is the one thing that drives growth in Turks and Caicos? Because it's a developing country. Construction. And then look at what you end up doing. When you get that moving, we become experts at how to carry out construction projects in a COVID environment. Why? Because the same electronic system that we use for the country Right. We use that for every job site. Right. You see? Yeah. And that's how we solve this problem. <laughs> and if we did that, I think we would have the largest economic boom in Turks and Caicos history. Right. Okay, I just want to pause for a moment. Um, I've been monitoring the live feeds. I've seen comments, but I didn't see any questions. I had one or two comments, but things that you had covered, it was just talking again about the lines, not being in the lines, and all this all adds up to smart technology in a smart community. That's right. That's right. right. I want to That's say right. this. Um, we have, of course, I know we were going to go with our time frame in a, a very <laughs> short time, very quickly. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't mind, but even before we wrap it up, I just want just we, as an economist, just to give me a synopsis of where do you think the, a comparison about the Turks and Caicos economy before COVID and now, what, I mean, can you just give a little analysis about that for me? Yes. Um, one of the things, um, Cayman Islands, about 30, 35% of Cayman Islands GDP is financial services. Mm-hmm. So in addition to your um, stamp duty exemption and 
your the the PRC by investment. Right. The third rail of what I would do is to build the financial services. Why? Because in Argentina, in Hong Kong, in Australia, and in Britain, companies are trying to find some place to go. And companies are COVID neutral. Right. COVID neutral. So you could set up the right system in Turks and we should have done that from January. So that while all this is going on and you're putting all these technologies in place and everything, we could have been licensing companies, licensing companies, licensing companies. And that required that's not you can't just advertise it and sit there. You Correct. actually have to send teams of people to these places to meet with law firms and people like that to generate this business. When you do in the financial services business, the basis of it are the companies. And when you negotiate, so when I was negotiating with companies, when I, I, I led a, 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 an official visit by the deputy premier, uh, the Honorable Floyd de Hall, to Singapore and to Hong Kong, we were trying to get 5,000 companies to move at one time from the far, the middle, the far East to Turks and Caicos. Mm. In, in one go. Absolutely. So that's how you do this kind of business, right? So that's something that we've left off the table that we're not paying attention to. So my view is this. Uh, when I take, uh, I think that, unfortunately, uh, we came out of the 2008 recession. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the 2008, yes, recession, uh, the, the global financial crisis. Yes. The country grew to some extent where we got the GDP up from around 700 million to a billion dollars. So Turks and Caicos is a billion dollar GDP at the moment, right? Okay. In my view, we just on the natural bit, we're going to face a severe constriction in that. But the, but the, the 800 pound uh, question, if you like, or $64,000 question, or however people put that. Right. right. For us, in the middle of all of this, so you've got tourism, you've got real estate, and then you've got financial services. But then you have the problems in the United States, lack of airline coverage, loss of income, all right? And then we have two things in Turks and Caicos that I don't think we've managed very well. Crime and migrants. Correct. And, and it, with the crime problem, if, if, the, if the premier comes to me and says, Morris, I'm going to put you a uh, head of a task force, I would say to her, oh, she says, now what's the first thing you're going to do? I would say, okay, Madam Premier, with the greatest of respect, I'm going to fire you and the governor. Not because you're bad or you've made big mistakes, nothing like that. Right. You two should be the people that I have to appeal to. You shouldn't be involved. Right. The task force should do everything. And then we come to you and report to you. Then you chew us out and take, take, take feedback from the population and then barbecue us and make us go and do better next time. Mm -hmm. That's the role you need to be in, right? And when you're doing that, it means that the, the, the program to deal with COVID ceases to be political. Right. Because there's no political person involved in it. Not that she made it political, but, but if you're a politician, it's going to be political. It, it will be political. When you, yeah, when you hire technocrats, you take the political edge off of it and it just becomes finding the best people who know what they're doing and know how to function in this sort of environment. So my belief is that you're going to see, I, I think we have probably used up a good chunk of the available cash. We can't allow the cash to go be so low a certain level because it triggers certain things. But if I were tasked with this as the head of a task force, mm -hmm. part of what I would be doing would be at the same time, to, because when you're dealing with a pandemic, you have to map out the whole country. You have to create a logistics map of the whole country. Streets, 
you know, air passages, where people go, how they get there, where the communities are, how people move in and out of them, road systems, everything. Right. So when you do that, I would also develop a plan for crime to address the crime situation at the same time. Because the same data you need to fight COVID, that data is useful to for fight. crime and identifying communities and how people, we say, ingress and egress, enter and exit out of communities, right? Right. Number two, if we had cash on hand, and I, I recommended that Turks and Caicos not use the cash it had on hand in January, okay. but in fact, Borrow, the, 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 the public finance ordinance allows us to borrow four or five times the cash that we have on hand. So if we had borrowed at that time when nobody else was borrowing, now everybody's borrowing, right? But if we borrowed at that time in January and you borrowed, say, $330 million, mm -hmm. you would have the money to do all these things right now. One of them would be, in addition to the crime, to solve the problem of the migrant issue. Right. Right. Which is solve that problem. And I say not address it, solve it. Okay. Because you cannot, if you have flotillas of 300 people, we, we love our Haitian brothers and sisters. We feel sorry about their plight and so on. It's actually dangerous for them to get on those boats. And the other day, I think last month, a bunch of people died trying to make it be even not even getting out of Haitian waters and they are being bamboozled and used. And, and when I was uh, assigned to the Turks and Caicos Canada uh, strategic uh, um, trade committee, the prime minister of Canada told us at the time that they were concerned. Canada was concerned about the human trafficking in the Caribbean basin, particularly between Haiti and the Turks and Caicos. Mm -hmm. So the Turks and Caicos Islanders involved in that, I would jail them. Right. And the bottom line is you have to stop those flotillas from coming because if you have 300 of these people coming, risking their lives, poor souls, every month, right. in the space of seven or eight months, you've, out, you've outpaced the Turks and Caicos population and you can't charge $1,500 a night for a place that's overrun with migrants. Right. Right. No matter how sorry we feel for them, you can't, it, the brand of Turks and Caicos is now there, and that was before COVID. It's on the attack. So in my forecast, I'm saying to you, we run the risk of the COVID for the economic analysis. These right. are our risks now. COVID-19, crime, migrants, and damaging our brand on a forward basis by not solving these problems. Because the world doesn't want to know all these little things about whether or not you got migrants and so on. Wealthy people just want to know they can buy a piece of land or buy a, a beautiful villa or buy a beautiful mansion and they, they can come and the place is safe and you have a way of monitoring things and food is available in the country and, they, and the, the, the crime is controlled. The last point I would make is this. Mm -hmm. On, on, in, in, on March 3rd, I produced a, 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 a proposal for a group to submit to the Ministry of Education because it was my argument, number one, the laptop for each child is abject nonsense. Why? It, it didn't work in the United States, and it's not going to work in Turks and Caicos, and it's not going to work in the Bahamas. And part of the reason is what we call the adoption adaption problem you can't adopt something that your people haven't adapted to you can't adopt something immediately then people tell people to adapt to it right away you have right. to have your adaption the process of adaption Correct. so that you can get the point of adoption right the the, the school system is not organized for this kind of thing it's not organized for that and so what we have to do is use cable channels. And while people are at home, use documentaries. I think this year is gone, right? Probably right up to next September. Gone. It's finished. You, you're not going to get, I mean, Japan did well, but then, and Taiwan did well in South Korea, but then they tested everybody in January. Right. When you have COVID outbreaks and so on, school becomes a problem. So 
the thing we have to do, we have to teach our population, because this won't be the last pandemic, we have to teach our population and get them in an ad adaption process. When I was teaching at George Mason University in, in, in 1997, we thought, the professors, we thought we were on the cutting edge because we had three rubbish bins in each classroom. And we said, oh, we are mixing, we are, we are separating our garbage, we're right on the cutting edge. My God, we are just, you know, environmentalists. Right. The 17, 18 year olds who came in as freshmen that year, they thought we were Neanderthals. They said, no, you need six rubbish bins, then you need special bags for this, then you need compost, okay, then you need this, then you need, and we were just like, oh my God, we, we just don't know what we're doing. But it's those children who taught us how to be an environmentally compliant and thoughtful institution. Right. You can never discount the knowledge what we call uh, swarm intelligence. Some people call it the wisdom of the crowd, right? So okay. it's a, it's a, in game theory, it's a principle in game theory. And my point is that when you have a process of adaption, mm -hmm. you actually learn things about your society that tells you how to implement a policy that you can't learn just listening to an expert who's done it somewhere else come and tell you to do it here. Right. You have to have this process of, ad of adaption is right. actually how you learn to implement policy in your own country. Correct. You see? So Estonia didn't go somewhere and figure out, oh, how can we do a left? They didn't go to Singapore and try to do, or Israel and try. They said, let's look at Estonia. Let's look at how we function and let's build something that's Estonian. Right. And so the, the, the other problem, the last problem is this education problem. And the program that I laid out has documentaries, use documentaries. So children are at home, parents are at home, a lot of them. And you use the COVID period to create an education renaissance. So there were documentaries on the origins of the universe, the function of the planets. All right. Uh, it has... Uh, um, the, the, the biology, human biology, how the body functions and right. so on, the relationship between the body and the environment, all right, all these sorts of things, documentaries on oceanography, documentaries on Caribbean history, documentaries on Bahamas history, Barbados history, Jamaican history, Asian history, and so on, Ge documentaries on geology, all these sorts of things. What does that do? So if you say there will be no regular education between now and next year, you're using this documentary period to increase the general knowledge of the population. So we do documentaries on the economy. Most Turks and Caicos Islanders don't understand how the economy functions. Correct. When when the British came in to to uh, to, to to suspend the constitution, the British experts said to me, "Oh, we have lots of revenue streams." And I said, "No, you don't." You have two. Every other revenue stream is a subset of those two. Right. Real estate and, and tourism. tourism. Yeah. And then everything built, everybody who's paying for driver's license and business licensing fees and so on is a component of those two driven by those two. You have co what we call corollary uh, uh, income streams. But they aren't recurrent in the way that these two are. So right. They didn't understand the Turks and Caicos economy. They went to Blue Hills and they were asking, how can these people afford these properties? And my thing is, hey, there are 14 original families of Bay Road, starting with the Rigby's, ending with the Parkers. Mm -hmm. All right? You need to know that. Correct. They've been, they've been here for 200 years in one way or the other. Right. You, 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 you can't come here and just see beachfront and think they bought these properties during one political regime it must be corruption and so on you're misunderstanding even the road you're on used to be a wall right so you know, they, have didn't to know that they didn't understand that so building something Turks and Caicos has a unique proposition I do feel that we should have borrowed in January but that ship has sailed now right so now I think we're in a position where while we have our numbers, we have 
solid financial uh, um, uh, uh, numbers okay. and, and, and statistics reasonably solid, they are not contrib contributing at the moment to economic growth and we're not using, they're not strategically organized because you can't organize them until you organize this technological platform that manages the pandemic in the right way, in a predictable manner, not guessing, a predictable manner. Correct. Well, thank you so much. It's a lot of information, and um, but it is very important. And a lot of points that you did raise, like I said, um, I didn't think about it. But one of the things I do agree, like I've said also about it, we need to, in this day and age, and I think COVID-19, has brought it to our attention even more so, if not before, and it's gonna push us and force us in that direction. It's about right. being more technologically savvy in our overall approach to everything else. You know, if, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's anything you have said, trust me, that is the top of the list right. what we need to do so we can right. get where we need to get to be right. able to sustain any of our um, you know, whether the real estate, whether the tourism sector, whether our local economy, anything, we do right. need that to be in place to be right. able to achieve any of it. I, I agree absolutely. And listen, I, it is my fondest hope that we are able to achieve that. Uh, you know, um, um, Turks and Caicos has a unique opportunity in the world to be an example because it is very small and we should be leveraging those opportunities, but we have to think in an organic way, an organic way. You can't just do one thing, one thing, one thing. You have to see how, what is called, that's why we call it interstitial demographics. And interstice is something where when you touch one thing, it has these effects over here, and then you, it has another effect over there. And you have, you have to know what it is that's happening. Because if you're running from place to place, you're going to be running and you're going to run out of steam. So I hope, I pray that, you know, these things, uh, that we get these things solved. It's the same here. Well, thank you yes. so much for joining me today on Let's well, Talk. Thank you, really thank you Cuz. Uh, it's great. Uh, we must do it again sometime. Definitely. I will reach out to you again. And okay. um, to the listening audience, I just want to say thank you for watching. Um, we did go over our time, but I think it was all worth it. And it is very good information that we all need to know. Um, and it is a lot of food for thought. So I'll say thanks once again. Thanks, um, Professor Morris. And until next week, audience, stay safe and remain blessed. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.